Hello and welcome back to Kim Reads as we continue with Great Expectations. Chapter 2, The Second Convict I was not too far from the ruined walls where I was to meet my man when I suddenly saw him. He was sitting with his back to me, his head nodding forward in sleep. I approached him softly and touched him on the soldier. He instantly jumped and whirled around. It was not the man, but another one. This one was also dressed in gray and wore an iron leg too, but his face was different. He swore at me and aimed a weak blow at my head. It missed me, but it made him stumble, so he must have been ill and cold. Then he ran off into the mist. I was sure he was the friend who cut out the boys' hearts. At the walls, I saw the right man stamping up and down to warm himself. As I took the food and the file from under my jacket, his eyes widened. With a shivering hand, he began to cram down the food. When I brought out the bottle, he said, What have you got there, boy, in that bottle? Brandy, sir, it helps ward off the chill of the marshes, I replied. He snatched the bottle from my hand and drank deeply. Then wiping his mouth the back of his hand, he said, Very thoughtful for a boy. You told no one? No, sir, no one. I stole the food. Nodding with satisfaction, he took a large bite of the pork pie until it was almost all gone. I'm glad you're enjoying it, I said. But aren't you leaving any for him? You mean my friend that cuts out boys' hearts, he said slyly. Then he laughed and added, he won't get any food. He looked like he might, I said. He immediately stopped and cried, looked? You saw him? Where? When? I spoke hurriedly, for he grabbed me by my collar and was glaring at me. He, he was down there, I, I stammered and pointed out in the direction. Dressed like you and with an iron on his leg. There was a gunfire for him last night. Didn't you hear it? I thought so, and then again I didn't. Being alone in these marches makes you lightheaded. What kind of face did he have? The frightened face that turned toward me with a gasp reappeared again in my mind. He had bruises on one cheek, I replied. The man drew his breath with, with a rasp. So it is him. I'll hunt him down like a bloodhound. Where's the file? Give me the file, boy. I picked up the file from the ground where he had thrown it when he grabbed the food. <laughs> Now, pushing aside the rest of the pork pie, he seized the file from me, knelt down to the wet grass, and began to file at his leg like a madman. He saw that I had to leave, but he paid no attention to me. I took a few steps backward to see if anyone would stop me. When he didn't look up, I turned and slipped quietly away. Then I started to run home. In the distance, I could hear him filing, filing, filing. At home, my sister was going around like a whirlwind, putting up clean white curtains and taking the dust covers off the furniture in the parlor. This room was used only on very special occasions, and Christmas is one of them. Joe and I had to eat breakfast standing up because my sister had no time to set a proper table. Before we finished eating, she had begun preparing dinner for guests were expected. My heart suddenly stopped beating for a moment. Could the pork pie have been met for today's festivity? So that horrible fear stayed with me as my sister washed my face and ears with her usual rough hand. Soon Joe and I were sitting stiff and uncomfortable in our best clothes at the parlor. At first a knock on the door, I opened it and it was Mr. Wopsle, the clerk of our church. Next came Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, the wheel maker and his wife. Last, in his own small carriage, came from un Uncle Pum Pumplechook, who was really Joe's uncle, although my sister had taken him over as a relation because he was a well-to-do seed merchant in town. She welcomed him warmly. Mrs. Joe, said Uncle Pumplechook, I brought you some of my wine as a compliment of the season. Shabby and port, he said this as if it were a great surprise, but... Since he brought the same gift everywhere, every year it surprised no one. Dinner was a gay affair for everyone except me. I was not allowed to speak. Much of the conversation centered on me and the burden I was to my poor sister. Joe was not allowed to deny this, but he tried to make it up by pouring large quantities of gravy on my meat. Soon, what I had been dreading happened. 
My sister said, Uncle Pumplechook, I have made a special favorite of yours, a pork pie. The applause of eager appetites followed her as she left for the pantry. I heard moving around there, and then there was a silence. She referred to his empty hand as, Goodness gracious, I don't understand it. The pie is gone. I could stand no longer. I had to escape. I jumped up from the table and rushed to the door. As I reached to it, it swung open and a party of soldiers entered. I ran blindly to the leader who called, Here you are, lad. Come on. And he had a pair of handcuffs out towards me. And that is the end of that chapter. See you later.